So, um, hi, good afternoon. Welcome to our Board Connect Forum um, on handling board conflicts in non-profit organizations. Brought to you by Center of Center for Nonprofit Leadership and if International Institute of Mediators. My name is Jensen from CMPL, a part of the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Center. Conflicts among boards in non-profit organizations are common. While board members of diverse backgrounds come together with strong convictions to serve, there are often differences in opinions. As such, we are bringing to you this forum to help charities identify the common conflicts in non-profits and their causes, use mediation techniques to resolve board conflicts, handle board conflicts in a way that preserves goodwill, improve relationships, maintain productivity and staff morale, leverage on collaborative solutions, resolve board conflicts and turn them around to drive organizational growth. Before I proceed further, I'd like to request your attention to some administrative instructions. First, I would like to request that all attendees' camera and mic be switched off during this forum. There will be a video and audio recording of the forum. If you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A chat function to comment or post your questions. If you would like to request for a copy of the presentation deck, Please email to info at iim.sg to request for the presentation deck. Thank you so much. I shall now invite Professor Lim Lan Yuan, President of IIM, to share with us his presentation. Dr. Lim has sat in a few boards as director, chairman, as well as CEO. He has pioneered the mediation movement in Singapore with over 40 years of experience he will share with us how board conflicts can be resolved using mediation skills. Over to you, please, Professor Lim. Right. Uh, thank you, Jensen, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked to speak on handling board conflicts, applying mediation skills. Now, this is the um, outline of what I'm going to speak in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I will first talk about conflicts and problems in the board and how we can avoid uh, some of them. Uh, I will then discuss what to do when there is a conflict and how we can apply uh, the mediation skills to resolve them. So why conflict arise? Conflict between parties arises because of differences or disagreements due to uh, misunderstanding, misperception, and uh, the lack of communication. If the underlying reason for the conflict is known, then we will be better able to help them to resolve their conflict. Most conflict can be resolved if the parties are prepared or willing or are effectively persuaded to settle. In this talk, I will speak about the conflict between the board and management. The board and management have common goals. Collectively, both are working towards the long-term well-being and interest of the company. Both belong to the same company and pursue the same objectives and goals. The major obstacle in, governance, in the governance of companies is ensuring the board and the management are able to delineate their different responsibilities. Usually the board's focus is the strategic task of setting out the company's goals and direction and also accountability framework. On the other hand, the management focus is overseeing day-to-day -day operations and the allocation of uh, resources of the company. However, problems and conflict can arise. First, the directors are not involved in management. They are not familiar with the daily activities of the company. And hence, they are unable to contribute effectively and will have to rely upon the management. On the other hand, 
there are some directors who get very involved in, a man, in many aspects of the management and exercising control of too much of a management. Second, the chairman of the board tends to have better information than other board members. As a CEO, usually speak or reports to the chairman. Third, directors are not knowledgeable about the industry and the business, and hence they are unable to participate and contribute effectively. Fourth, there could be a conflict between directors and management as they hold different views and approaches to the direction for business growth and development. And fifth, of course, there could be disagreement between or among directors over various matters. For example, whether to undertake certain activities or investment, deciding on certain projects or other causes of action, or just because of differences in personality and relationship. And sixth, there could also be differences between the CEO and the key management. Let me share with you a small conflict in the board. The discussion is about the problem of lack of accommodation and space. So the board is to decide whether to extend their own existing building or to tear down the building and rebuild a larger building. So directors are undecided on the course of action. So the issue is about how to make the correct decision and how this decision is to be arrived at having encountered disagreement among the directors. Now we'll come back to this later on. So how conflict can be avoided? The suggestion is to introduce best practices. The board is collectively responsible for the long-term interest and success of the company. The board works with management to achieve this. And the management should remain accountable to the board. We should establish a clear division of responsibility between the leadership or board and the executive responsible for managing the company's business. Institute a formal and transparent process for the appointment and reappointment of directors to the board, taking into account the need for appropriate composition, uh, diversity, and experience. Introduce formal annual assessment of the effectiveness of the board as a whole and its board committees and the contribution by each director. Provide more technical trainings in duties, roles and responsibility to the board and management. Directors should be provided with complete and timely information prior to the board meeting and on an ongoing basis to enable them to make informed decisions. Establish a formal and transparent procedure for developing policies on executive remuneration and the individual directors. So what do we do when there is a conflict? Now the earlier recommendation will help to prevent conflict. Should the conflict arise, discuss and talk things out, negotiate. Failing which, get someone to mediate since both the board and management have the same goals and interest to resolve the issues internally. So how can we apply mediation skills? Let me briefly explain what mediation is about. Mediation is the use of a neutral third party to assist party in conflict. Mediators facilitate the discussion between the two disputing parties by helping them to negotiate to reach an amicable solution. Now we should note that mediators do not decide for the parties. The parties make their own decision, assisted by the mediators. Let me briefly describe what goes on in the mediation. A four-stage process is commonly used. The mediator first introduce the mediation process and brief the parties on this role and set the ground rules for discussion. 
the parties are then asked to relate their story, their side of the story, to enable the mediator, as well as the other party, to understand the issues in conflict. Having identified the issues, then the mediator works with the party to arrive at suitable solutions. Mediators will brainstorm with each party or both parties and may meet each party privately in what we call caucus. And finally, if the party agrees on the solution, then the terms of settlement are drafted and signed, terminating the mediation session. Of course, in an informal setting like in a court, there may not be a need to sign a written agreement. And the mediation process is likely to be less formal and less procedural. So what are the goals in mediation? The success of mediation depends on the willingness of the party to settle and also the skills and the techniques of the mediator. Mediation helps party to retain their goodwill and relationship as both parties attempt to achieve a win-win solution. In mediation, we work at solutions amicable to both parties rather than to pinpoint faults and blame. Mediation is not about who is right or wrong. So how can we acquire mediation skill? Well, attend a five-day mediation training to acquire the basic skill. And let me do a bit of a commercial here. The IIM will be holding such a training in May over two and a half uh, weekends, and those who are interested may want to contact us. So let's now come back to the topic. What do mediators do? There are various techniques and skills that we would not be able to cover in this very short talk. I'll just mention a few things that mediators will do. First, look at conflict objectively. Now, it is not easy to look at conflict in an objective manner, particularly so when we are involved in the conflict ourselves. We tend to view conflict from our own perspective and believe we are correct. But if we remain calm and composed, it is not difficult to realize that there are at least two sides to a conflict. Your view, as well as the other party's view, and both of us may be correct as we look at different perspectives of the same thing. Next, capture the essence of the conflict. Mediator needs to know exactly what issues are in dispute in order to help parties. Sometimes it is not immediately obvious what the issues are about. It is essential for mediators to check and confirm his or her understanding of the conflict between the parties. A clearly defined conflict will help to find an appropriate solution to the problem. Next, avoid one-sidedness. Mediator needs to show fairness and impartiality. Here we are talking about perception. The mediator may believe that he's neutral, but the party thinks otherwise. So watch the words, the choice of words used, and your question, questioning tactics as a mediator. It may appear to the parties that you are pressurizing them or you are unfairly to them. It is important for the mediator not to show bias or favoritism to one party as against the other. It should give equal opportunity to both parties to present. Next, and I think this is very crucial, generate options. Party needs alternative and option solution in order to settle their conflict. Brainstorm with the party for solution. Ask party to look from different perspectives. This stage of mediation is often the most creative part, the success of which will depend on the experience and the skills of the mediator to help parties to generate options. Now, sometimes resolving conflict is about decision-making. What conflict may be largely categorized into two big areas, one dealing with personal relational issues, and the other deal with technical management issues, which ultimately involve decision-making. 
And it is useful to discuss at the outset how broad decision is to be made. For example, the type of information required, the duration of the discussion, whether external expertise or expert is required, is there a leader who would finally make the decision? Or if, if it's a cooperative decision by the board, uh, then is it based on a simple majority? Or there are certain percentage, either two-third major, majority or so on. So applying mediation approach systematically can help resolve problems. Identify the issue, brainstorm for solution, and select the best option, implement the decision and monitor the situation, and gather data about the decision impact and make changes if possible. So let us go back to the small conflict uh, encounter board that I mentioned earlier. So just to recap, the discussion then was about the lack of accommodation and space. So the board is to decide whether to extend the existing building or to tear down the building and rebuild a larger building. So directors were undecided on the course of action. The issue is about decision making rather than serious confrontation or conflict among directors. And how this decision is to be arrived at, having encountered disagreement among the directors. So if we apply the standard decision making process, right, identify a problem, gather relevant information on a problem, weigh the pros and cons of various alternatives, select the best option, make the decision and implement, and then to monitor or review the decision if possible. So in this case, should we consider extension or rebuilding? So what are the pros and cons? If you are talking about extension, the pros of course, the cost is less expensive. As a saving of time, it's easier to extend and to rebuild. And you can continue to stay in the premises. You need not seek alternative accommodation. The cons of course, we are still dealing with the same design same configuration, same outdated structure on the site. No innovation, no additional facilities. And if we look at rebuilding, the cons of course will be more cost. This may be a problem because you need funds. It will take longer time and it may require us to ship out and will require space during the rebuilding and additional rental costs will be involved. And of course, the, the pros of course will be there's opportunity now to upgrade with better facilities opportunity to use more space, opportunity to reap the site potential. And we also have to compare the returns for both options. And I have not complicated the issue because the director can also consider a third option to sell the existing site and to relocate. So if given the relevant information and through a systematic process with calm debate and argument and discussion, we should be able to arrive and the suitable decision. So let me now conclude. Both conflict can be resolved in amicable way. Both functions best when focused on high level future oriented methods of strategy and policy. And of course, they perform its oversight duties in a rigorous, efficient manner. Board members should be committed and play an important role in board affairs. The board must be informed and the directors want to be engaged to make a difference. Management must play its part in supporting the board by providing relevant information. Directors' fresh thinking, new ideas and knowledge are important, but yet the board should try to avoid managing. So in the event of conflict, discuss openly and negotiate, failing which to apply mediation skills. You need not be a professional or full-time mediator, but the mediation skills, which is a useful life skill that you acquire, will help you to better understand why conflict comes about and how to handle them, looking from the other party's viewpoint as well. So the objective in mediation is really to facilitate settlement. Both parties can live with, even though this is not what the original wanted. So to use mediation skill effectively, we need to learn how to communicate and look at conflict positively and objectively with the understanding that there's always another side to the story. So with this, I will end my talk 
and I hope uh, it has given you some food for thought and encourage you to acquire some basic mediation skills. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Jensen, you want to take over? Yes, thank you so much, Prof Lim, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Indeed, you mentioned um, many times about the relationship, uh, the importance of relationship between the board and the directors and the management, the board of directors and the management, I think it's very important that you highlight this. I have also shared um, in the chat group about the five-day mediation training course that you have mentioned. Um, so for participants who would like to sign up for that, please uh, click on the link to go to IIM website. Now I will be hanging over to Mr. Jufri Osman, executive member of IIM, to bring on our panelists for the interactive panel discussion. Jofri is a very experienced mediator, facilitator, and trainer. As a trained mediator, he has been active at the Community Mediation Center and Singapore Mediation Center. He is passionate about peace building, multicultural and multi-religious understanding and conflict transformation style of resolving conflicts. Over to you, Jofri. Hi, Jensen. Thank you so much, Jensen. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Lim. Uh, appreciate that. Hi, guys. I think today we are very fortunate to have these uh, sessions. I think uh, it is also good for us to listen to very experienced people. And I would like to introduce you to the panelists. I think it's best for me to ask them to introduce themselves. Okay. Uh, I would like to call Mr. Gopal, which I call my abang, my brother. Mr. Gopal, maybe you'd like to share with us, maybe to uh, very briefly about yourself, Mr. Gopal. Gopal, go ahead. Mr. Gopal. Gopal, you there? Can you hear me? Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, Gopal, yeah. good. Great. Yeah. Uh, yes, I've been in mediation for the past 15 over years. Uh, especially community mediation and uh, other forms of, uh, including pet mediation and, and all, all the you, all conflicts that arise out of uh, the two parties or many parties. So uh, I've been very much involved with CMC, Community Mediation Centre and Ministry of Law, and uh, also with IAM as Assistant Secretary, trying to resolve and providing training programs for our members. Thank you. you. Maybe you'd like to bring down a little bit of your camera, Gopal, so we can see your, your face. Yep. Can you see me now better? Cool. Better, Babang. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thank you, Gopal. And again, another uh, thank you so much, Gopal. Uh, again, I'd like to, to introduce you my another Abang, which is my brother, uh, Mr. Eric. Uh, Eric, maybe you'd like to share with them a uh, little bit of, about yourself. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Eric. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Wong. I've been... Um, involved in the grassroots for more than 30 years and the mediation more than 20 years. Um, and also I am uh, involved in the management of the home for the agent. So I hope that um, through this platform, we can actually share and also learn from each other, you know, uh, the, the skills and experiences and all that. Um, in modern times, eh, in times like us are in, change is the norm. So we got to continue to uh, unlearn and relearn and moving forward. So I'm looking forward to a fruitful uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Abang. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next, we go to Mr. John. So John, can you hear me? You need to... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, you need to on your video. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but we need to see you, Mr. John. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I have clicked. Okay, right good. Down. Now we can see you and hear you. Go ahead. All right. Um, I'm John Ang, and um, I have uh, several decades of teaching behind me. I have been retired from the National University of Singapore, um, where I taught social work for many decades. And um, I've also been on the boards of um, many voluntary welfare organizations. Currently, I'm president of 
Fayette Community Service Services. And um, I'm just happy to be here because um, we have so many people who are experts in their field. I'm looking forward to an exciting exchange with them so that I can learn from them and uh, I can contribute some views where I think may be interesting for our listeners to consider. Thank you, John. John, if you see the chat, Ian Yo said, John, you taught me almost two decades ago. <laughs> There's a chat, John. I know that you're using a mobile phone. It's a bit difficult, but yeah. Ian Yeo mentioned that, John, you taught me almost two decades ago. So good seeing you. Good seeing you. All right, John. Right, okay, um, next. Good to see you too, yeah. Okay, let's move on to uh, Wee Hoon. Yeah. Wee Hoon, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wee Hoon. I serve on the board of a charity organization, YWCA. Uh, where I'm the second uh, vice president over there. Uh, in addition, I also sit on two other boards. Uh, one is on the board of an insurance company and another is on a board of a fintech startup uh, that does global advisory. Uh, very happy to be here as a panelist uh, among all the esteemed panelists with a uh, wealth of experience uh, where I can learn from, uh, from them uh, and also happy to, hear, to be here to perhaps uh, share my perspective from what I've seen uh, in the boardroom as well. Thank you, Sufri. Thank you, Yihun. Okay, I think uh, it's good for us to start. I think, let me just remind you, you have Q&A, uh, you can just type in under Q&A. If you can also type in your questions on, uh, under the chat. So let me just do some disclaimer, whatever that they mention or they're gonna share with us today, is strictly based on their own personal insight, okay? So it's strictly from their own personal insight, own experiences and all that. So I do appreciate, uh, you know, your understanding. So it doesn't mean, right, guys, because we are sharing all this conflict, they have their own issues with their own organizations, no. Eh? But we are very glad to have them to really share. And I really told them, let us be very honest and very frank from sharing your own experiences. We have a lot of questions, but let me just start. So if I can sh hear from all of you. So the question that I'm going to ask you first before I go through the, uh, to the rest of the questions. Uh, what are some common board conflicts you have seen, you have experienced? Maybe I'll start with Gopal first. My question is, what are some common board conflicts you guys have seen, right? When you, when you are in this, uh, in, in this field. So Gopal, you'd like to share first? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things is uh, uh, the conflict of, I mean, the, I mean, it's already mentioned by Dr. Lim in his uh, opening, the uneasiness between the board and the uh, staff, you know, the management staff and issues that arise out of poor communications. Uh, the other possibilities are, I mean, you're siding with one, some, management staff may be uh, more comfortable with certain board members and then you tend to have certain conflicts. And so it is very important from the onset to draw up what the lines of authority that you know, how much can you actually uh, be with? Because some people try to influence you and then, then the whole thing becomes upset in terms of uh, management and the board. The other point of thing is that board members drawn from different sectors of society should not have in any form of uh, duality of interest, which means they may be representing two other uh, charity organizations, you know, and then they want to make a decisions. They find it extremely difficult. Maybe, uh, maybe you may be advocating for your own interests, so there could be a conflict of interest that may arise out of it. And I've seen this often coming up. Maybe I'll let the others share. Thanks, Gopal. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Gopal. Eric, from your perspective, your own experience, so oh, sometimes um, I just refer maybe some of the simple uh, things that happen, you know, certain issues that arises um, in the whole management, for example, certain things that happen which um, may may bring some disrepute yeah, to the organizations. And some of these um, directors, they may have different ideas. Yeah to do according to the books, do following the policies. And in the midst of it, I mean, cases are different from one to the next and it can be having one. So each of these cases that comes along, which can bring uh, damage to the um, 
organizations and all that, we need to really study it and get everyone to be aligned to understand what's in. And also the ways, the pro and cons and all that to come to a, a resolution. Whereas um, during these uh, discussions, there may be some um, heated arguments and debates and all that, but keep in mind that we've got to keep ourselves cool and weigh the pros and cons and deliver it. There is no um, so-called right and wrong, and we have to do our best in mitigating uh, issues. And uh, most importantly, I uh, hope that it happens again. So this is actually an um, experience that I have to like to share. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, uh, John. Um, I would like to uh, go from a different perspective. Uh, I think what. Eric and Gopal um, uh, and, um, and Prof Lim was sharing, I think, uh, very valuable points. But uh, I want to concentrate on relationship and regard, uh, two related points of view. Relationship is um, you like me, I like you. And uh, regard is do you respect me? Do you, um, do you have proper regard to my point of view? Uh, and I think that in my experience in many charity boards, this um, unfortunately uh, occasionally comes up because we are working together in a board uh, and it's a board to do good and so I would like to believe that all of us go into the board with all the positive uh, contributions that we hope to make. Um, and we come with different skills, different experiences. And when we are invited to be on the board, we feel that perhaps there's something relevant that we can, can contribute to this organization. So we come in, uh, ready to do some good, you know? And then um, we face several people who may be long in the board with uh, knowledge of the history of the organization to which you, if you come in new, uh, have no knowledge. They have a previous transactional relationship with each other some of them may go makamakan, may visit each other, may, you know, um, have um, liking for each other and they share history together of which I'm not a party to. And so particularly for new board members, it is very important to make them feel included. And, um, and how, the board chairman or the board business is conducted, it has to be done in a way where everybody's views are regarded. And um, if we can regard their views, and even if we want to challenge their views, that's okay, but make them feel that they're not talking nonsense. Sure. You know? Sure. And, and make make a determined effort, each board member, make a determined effort to like your colleagues on the board. Because I think to me, regard and relationship are the two most important factors. Thanks, John. I think that's one question uh, that's quite relevant uh, to you uh, about the new and the new board members versus uh, you know, uh, the seniors or the experienced board members. I would like, to, to ask you that question, I think by uh, by one of the uh, participants, uh, but I would like to hear from Hui Hoon first, and after that we go through some questions. Hui Hoon, what are the experience, uh, some of the board, uh, you know, conflicts or problems? Uh, I think uh, sometimes tension can arise when there is a change. So for example, um, if, the, if there is a shift from a volunteer-led organization to one where you are transitioning uh, where the, to the management, uh, where there's professional management. So board members who in the past could be used to making day-to-day -day operational decisions previously, they have to recognize that their role has shifted 
and it's moved from one from a day to day uh, perspective to one of an oversight. And uh, if they don't, uh, then obviously there's tension. There's also a risk that, that you will be stifling the executives. I think a second example where there is tension that arises when there's a change would be perhaps the needs and the direction of the organization has changed. And collectively, the board's uh, direction is moving to uh, a different direction. And if that's not clearly communicated to the ED, for example, then the ED may continue to operate in the same manner and not meeting the expectations of the board. And so I think uh, to that extent, then a clear communication and uh, expectation would have to be done to ensure that this change is acknowledged and, and agreed upon. Thanks, Vihun. So what I'm hearing from you is about, uh, technically, it's about clear communications, all that. Uh, John, there's one question. There's a lot of questions uh, from, from our participant. I would like to ask John, because you talk about relationship. You, you like me, I like you. One of the questions they ask, I am a new to a board of non-profit organizations. Okay? And I found that the elders are not willing to share, listen and accept the new perspective of newer younger members. Also, there are no succession plan in boards that helms by elderly chairman or presidents. What's your views on this, John? And after that, maybe I'll ask the rest of the panelists. Okay, as I said, um, there are two ways of looking at this. Huh? Um, as a new board member, you come with um, a lot of fresh ideas which are not tested in this particular organization. Uh, and you are full of idealism when you decided that you want to accept the invitation to join the board. And by the way, many boards are now trying to renew themselves. And so um, they are willing to take in new members. But that is not the same as um, retiring old members. So some old members, um, may be very sensitive to the fact that wow, you come in with all these big shot ideas, you know, and um, and you have no regard to my contribution in this organization for 30 years, you know. You don't know a, a thing about what happened to this organization last time. And so there are two points of views. And I think it is important, first of all, for the old guard, so to speak, to ask themselves this serious question, do I really want new blood? And if they are serious and honest uh, about it, for the sake of the organization, they really do or should welcome new blood because we cannot be in an organization forever. There will come a time when we have to leave by dint of age or whatever. So for the old guard, it is important for you to seriously examine our attitude towards the newcomers and to say, can I seriously and happily extend this, well, uh, this hand of welcome to them? Now, if you make this determined effort, huh, it will show in many ways in a way you welcome them in your smile, in your chit chat with them and so on. And they feel good. And once a new member gets the vibe that you accept him or you accept her, uh, this is the very important first step. But for the new board members, it is important for us to not rush in we have a lot of ideas, a lot of things we want to do, but uh, let's listen a little bit more. Let's um, mm -hmm. have a little bit more regard to the people who have been there for a long time. And uh, maybe they, with their experience, they have a point there. And if you cannot process those points during the meeting, you can always after the meeting say, hey, just now you were, talking about this particular point, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more. What's the history of it? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more? What is your thinking behind it? So 
a determined effort to try and understand each other, I think is precious. Thanks, John. Hewan, I think you talk about clear communications. The linking to these questions, right? Do you have any personal experiences, your own? Uh, you know, how can you communicate clearly when between the new board members uh, and also the senior, or what uh, John mentions, the old guard that need to be serious and the attitude to accept the new board? I think if you are a new person uh, joining uh, any board, uh, you know, obviously you are asked to join it because you have, uh, you know, a certain skill set or background experience that they would value you. Uh, but I think what's most important is you don't come in with the view that uh, by, by thinking that you just want to contribute and giving your view. Uh, I think actually sometimes active listening, it's important. Uh, it's important to come into a new place to learn a bit more about the history, the background, the information. It is actually from there, then perhaps uh, you could refine some of the suggestions and thoughts and idea and then bring it up uh, so that it's more relevant. Because if you come off uh, straight off with ideas and suggestions, without due regard to uh, hearing from people or understanding the organization's background, uh, you may be perceived as someone uh, that don't understand enough and just trying to make change for the sake of that. And so I, I think, um, you know, if, you know, I, I would advise active listening uh, being one thing that it's important. Uh, secondly, I think sometimes uh, it, takes, uh, it takes two to build a relationship and it doesn't necessarily just have to happen uh, by itself in the boardroom itself. And I think it is valuable sometimes to actually step outside of the boardroom uh, to build those relationships outside. From there, you could uh, A, uh, ask questions that you may not feel comfortable asking first and get more insight from uh, you know, some of the uh, members who has been around longer, but also that helps to build uh, relationship and trust so that when there is something that you want, you do want to raise and that's contentious, uh, it is, I find that sometimes it's helpful to socialize it uh, ahead uh, and, and get the views and ideas and then get people warm up to the idea before you go into, you know, a meeting and, and start, you know, bringing up uh, suggestions for changes. Thank you, and I think you reminded us, I think we all know about active listening, right? It's easy to to say it and all that, but it's not easy to do. But I think it's one of the key factor, you know, active listening and to like, uh, like John mentions, build up the relationship. Uh, okay, I'd like to go to these questions. Uh, maybe Eric and Gopal, you might uh, want to answer this. Uh, mediation suggests that there is a third party who will help mediate a disagreement between two individuals. Do you think it's better to ask the two individuals to privately discuss and resolve the disagreement first? And what at what stage is it appropriate for a, a third party to step in? Maybe Gopal, you'd like to answer this first after that, Eric? Yeah, um, first and foremost, I think the two speakers earlier to me, I think they have made very clear, conflicts do arise everywhere. So whether it's a board, uh, you know, non-profit organization or profit organization do arise. And the important thing is that, I mean, there's, I mean, if there is a conflict, there's always a way forward before even, because you are talking about saving face. So when you talk about saving face, you don't have to make it look as though it's mediation or litigation or whatsoever. So before that, you know, parties can actually get into some kind of talks. If they can, if you can achieve it themselves, they maintain the relationship better, I feel so. But really, if they can't, there's an obstacle, then of course, going forward, we, we get a third party mediators to involve with skill set that can understand the underlying issues and see whether there can be a compromise, they can arrive, then we can resolve the issue. So it's, in mediation, it's all about, all about just solving the issues to facilitate to a solution. That's what mediation is all about. Yeah? So yeah, and we want to maintain the relationship between the parties wherever it's possible. Right, Jeffrey? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gopal. Eric? Okay, I think mediation is uh, not necessarily to have three parties or four parties. You know. The mediator can actually step up and allow the two parties to speak first. From my experience, I came across a case whereby 
um, both of them requested me to step out. They will settle it, they speak, and then end of the day, they invited me in and they dropped out the agreement all by themselves. So this will be the most uh, beautiful um, so-called uh, situations whereby in mediation session, without the mediators and among themselves, somehow they compromised. So that, that actually can be done. And it should be done that way if it's requested by parties. You know, because um, sometimes due to, as uh, Gopal mentioned about ego and all that thing, uh, then uh, we may need to step in a little bit and try to manage them uh, um, during the caucus, the private sessions and all that. Otherwise, if they are still in talking terms and the, the so-called common ground is established, it's the way actually they give in and give in and out, you know, for each other actually to maneuver and to manage so that the resolution can come by naturally. And I want to add yes. on to what uh, Eric had just said. Must understand that uh, in nonprofit organizations, we normally have a great world diversity, whether in terms of race, age, religion. So how do you come bring this all together? Because naturally there will be some conflict, like just not John said, some new people coming. How are you going to include them? And like he wouldn't have said that uh, newcomers should be, you know, I, get slowly involved. Off the line, they can always talk it out over coffee or tea and then uh, uh, look at the issues that they have uh, that they can resolve outside uh, the board meetings or whatsoever. So so we, we a lot of communication involved. So, and the people that we bring in, they also must understand the vision and the mission of the organization, the core values. So from there, they can build up the relationship and, you know, greater rapport can be. Sometimes we just go in without understanding the, the vision and the mission of the organization and then get, it goes into various kinds of conflicts because there is diversity in the board room. So we have to bear this in mind and uh, accordingly work to tailor it because the volunteers or the board comes in, the, they're passionate people who comes in, whereas the management is paid staff. And so there is, there's going, definitely going to be some kind of conflict somewhere, some sometime. So driven by passion, we come in as volunteers and the others, the management takes and ensure that the day-to-day -day running is carried out according to the fraction of what the board has set forth. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Gopal. I think uh, there's one question regarding, uh, you know, I think different uh, style of mediations. The question here is, in corporate world, mediation is common tool deployed. How and what kind of mediation tool to apply for external commercial dispute and internal shareholder dispute. So technically, between external commercial disputes and the internal shareholder disputes. We uh, want John. You want to? Um, can you can you explain? I didn't quite hear you. Yeah. The the, the, the question in, here put. In the commercial uh, world. Yeah. So in the commercial world, right? So what's the difference between the commercial worlds? You know, uh, it, it is normal to deploy, you know, to deploy uh, mediations, okay? Yeah. But internally, okay. as a shareholder, is it possible to do that? Maybe I can um, add first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think whether you are commercial or internally, uh, mediation can be applied. But it may not necessarily be the first course of action as uh, Gopal has mentioned earlier, right? Uh, if there is actually a conflict, uh, it, is, it may be best if it can be resolved by the two party or uh, if you have to bring in a third party, it doesn't have to be an external mediator. Uh, it could be actually uh, maybe a third member in the board that could be seen as uh, you know, respectable and, as, uh, and, and is able to be fair and, and uh, mediate between the, the two disputing directors then or, or two individuals, it is possible. Uh, I think in most cases, uh, it's best to resolve something internally uh, and by the two individuals, where only to the extent that I think it, it, it's gotten a bit more acrimonious and uh, you know, they, it, 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 it may then make sense to have a, a third party uh, to get involved. Yeah, you know, if John, you yeah. remember what, what Prof Lim just now said about the essence of the conflict, I think it's important to get to the essence of the conflict. In my experience, um, leading boards, 
uh, and being member of the board is that it's slightly different when you're talking about two parties. Two parties meaning either two individuals or two uh, parties line up against each other. It's very seldom do you find in a VWO a situation where the parties are lined up against each other on a single issue. And what usually um, I find helpful is that if you sense that positions are hardening, you know, um, you don't want to allow it to go to a point where people cannot back down, you know. Uh, I have this point of view and you have the other point of view and then we argue, argue it out. Once the positions are hardening, uh, you, you know you have less and less scope to influence. So I like to um, make sure that whether when I lead um, a committee or board meeting or whatever, uh, I'm very sensitive to interpersonal processes. And I think that being sensitive to interpersonal processes is actually very, very important to prevent issues from hardening up and people from closing their ears, not listening to each other because they want to push their point of view. Um, and if you can sometimes inter, uh, interject with some humor, um, maybe take the, take the heat away and, and put it aside for a while and let some other quieter members speak and so on. Or for that matter, if somebody um, ends up feeling that he has lost his position, um, meaning he has been voted on and he has lost, even though you win, the committee members, the board members feel that they have won an issue, they have actually lost because there's somebody who is unhappy. And what I think as a leader, we want to maintain a culture where people don't end up after a meeting getting hurt and going away trying to, you know, um, see what can I do to take revenge next time. And there are many situations where there are deferred uh, sabo. Deferred sabo is you sabo me this time, huh? you better remember because next time I'm gonna sabo you. And that's because the relationship is not good anymore. Yeah. So as a leader, sometimes you will have to, if you can prevent it, prevent it. But if you can't prevent it after the meeting, you go and apply the koyo, you know? You go to talk to this person and say, yeah, I understand your point of view. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, it happened this way, but can you see this point of view? And this person, what he was trying to say, and you try and patch them up, you know, and try and encourage them to talk to each other outside the meeting so that we really don't need to come to a situation where we are banging heads, you know? Thanks, John. I think you would, you brought up a uh, tit for tat mentality, right? Uh, sabotage, you know, if I have an opportunity to sabo you one day, I will do that. Uh, but you also figure out it's important, the corridor, so to speak, the corridor negotiations, you know, uh, to talk to the parties that involve. I just want to ask Eric and Gopal, you know, have you ever experienced this, right? Uh, internal or shareholders that you need to mediate or you need to do some negotiations. Have you experienced that? Uh, Eric, how you guys do it? If in your board, there are a few members, be it, you know, the eldest members or even the new one, and you see that you, you feel it and there's a conflict or you've seen it, and what kind of approach you do? Eric? I think not necessarily shareholders also in the corporate world. Um, in BWOs, I believe that the elders or maybe the, the chair you know, of the management and all that uh, must understand um, the way between them and what's good and what's not so good. But in that context, allow it to surface and even allow it to take shape, to show 
to show that we are inclusive. No ideas are actually shot down, only due to certain um, bad um, outcome that have experienced it before. And also as an elder, you have to earn that respect to be a mentorship position to the younger ones. So um, you have to earn that in order to be able to stabilize it. You can have- Sorry, so, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt, Eric. I think yes. uh, you brought, we always, we always hear people talk about earn the respect. Can you give one example where you really get that respect from your members, you know, I know that you you've been involved in grassroots many many years, and how you earn that respect from your residents, from your members. To Maybe be listen, one example. To listen, as uh, what the people mentioned, to be a good listener, and then also to give appropriate advice, not placing yourself in the limelight, but instead encourage them to do more. You know, whatever your proposal and all that, well, it's a good proposal. We will try to do it, but at the same time, we must follow through to be a guide, to be a mentor to whoever it is, and sometimes let them see you know, the negative uh, part of it. And again, we have to be the safety net so that the overall um, outcome of the initiative, it can be tweeted, it can be saved, or it can be so-called a uh, 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 achievable. So in this way, actually, you gain respect, you gain that so-called uh, 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 you know, among them. So in this way, actually, you can do it. The other way is that maybe if you um, organizing some events and all that, you know, big amount of funds has to be so-called um, um, generated from sponsors or contributors, whatever, be the first to be in there to look for sponsorships. So be it action-wise, Thought-wise, uh, fundraising-wise, you always have to take the worst job. Okay. That is how you gain so, respect. So uh, you, a chairman you. actually is just to chair a meeting. You know, to a certain extent, if you read the constitution correctly and all that, you just a chair a meeting. Everyone has got equal rights. Unless you come to a certain stage where the chairman has to step in, again, you have to show respect to everybody. PWO members who join us actually is for for the good of the institution, it's not for self uh, limelighting and all these things, like no benefits. That is the, 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 the bottom line. Even in PA, uh, there is a decorum for all the grassroots uh, uh, leaders. So we read the decorum and see what we are doing today, what we are reflecting today is so-called um, reflecting what is supposed uh, to be to act as such. Thank you, Eric. Gopal? Yeah, Jeffrey, I think I just want to clarify your earlier question was basically you're talking about commercial mediation, but I think Eric was slightly digressing to grassroots because I know he's a grassroots guy, me too. But I think uh, uh, that was... In, in general, right? yeah. 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 Let's, let's do it in, in general. Uh, have you, I mean, uh, this is a center for non-profit organizations, so I don't want to diversify too much into the profit because it, uh, commercial uh, mediation is more about profit motivation factors that arise. Sure. So sure. we'll stick to it. And I think the important thing here, it is uh, to understand uh, why we are here. And to say that chairman, just in the meeting is not right for me. The chairman should know his role. He must have a good persona that he is in, he works with everybody, he's a team player. Uh, though he's a leadership and he's, he's leadership by example, you know, and there must be harmony of objectives. And all of us should, right through that you know then we we can accomplish minimize the conflict levels you know at every stage or every situation between the board between, between the board members or within the board and the management so uh, i wouldn't think the chairman is just going to be sitting there and be chairing the meeting he has a great role to play and he cannot be just say that uh, you know he can have his subcommittees various kinds of business development committees or other committees that can take care of all issues but I think he has an important role. His, you know, his persona is very important as, as part of the team. You know, uh, he is, uh, no man is an island. So, so say so. So we have to work together and collaborate together to achieve the, the vision and the mission of the uh, nonprofit organization. So even other organizations for that matter. Uh, so well, I, you, you have, sorry, Gopal, just, uh, just to jump in, you ever share with me, uh, yeah. you know, how you handle certain, uh, the internal shareholder conflict, 
uh, you said you do it like you no know, copy talk before yeah, the I mean, can yeah, you just maybe I mean, yeah. give one specific example yeah. Gopal? and uh, yeah i mean there was a situation where you know uh, a staff had a closer rapport with some somebody some other board members and he was trying to influence because he felt that you know he's not being treated by the ed executive director or whatsoever so you know and he comes to us so what i did was to have a cop- copy talk with him a coffee chat with him talk to him so that it doesn't look like very much a formal mediation sometimes the word mediation itself can be a little bit you know uh, may not feel good to some people you know there was so something happened that's why you're going to mediate and even though it's a third party if we are impartial in all our you know uh, approaches but uh, the perception may be go wrong so it's better to have uh, a pre mediation so called pre mediation chat with the guy or person concerned and talk to him and then over the coffee without escalating too far away and things may resolve at that at that level before it goes into a, a real mediation session also to speak so i mean any formal sessions do play a part so i'm trying to tell you sure yeah all right Right. Thanks, Gopal. All right, guys. Uh, I think wow, well, we are running out of time. So short, but maybe I'll just take this five minutes because before I pass it to Kitan, uh, maybe you like to wrap up. Uh, maybe start from Hyun. Is there anything? Uh, if it's one thing, right, or two or three uh, points, uh, sentences, uh, or you would like to share that it is must. You know, they must at least acknowledge this. Okay. Besides what you mentioned earlier on, is active listening is very important. But what else uh, do you think is important that you can share with the rest? Well, I think uh, if you are a chair of the uh, the board or the committee, uh, firstly, I think that role is very important, um, and it's important to establish a healthy balance in terms of the discussion among the members. So if you have a domineering uh, person on the board, then I think the role of the chair is to make sure the person is reining uh, and allow for opportunity to draw other quieter members to come up and uh, you know say their view. So firstly, I think the role of the chair is very important uh, in ensuring that. And also uh, by leading by example is therefore important. If your behavior is some is one that is respectful uh, and one that it, that shows uh, civility to others and and not uh, make personal attacks then i think the conduct of the meeting and the interaction will change because you are behaving in that way and you have to stop those behavior that actually makes it destructive in a meeting so so i think that's that's one that's very important finally i think we should recognize that if on a board right and uh, with different individuals coming from different backgrounds it is invariable that you are going to come with conflicts and disagreement so uh, i mean for for one thing if the board doesn't have that it's not an effective board that means you know you're not contributing and probably that's group think think and it's not uh you know that's not good for the future of the organization as well so really key is not to have not to not have disagreements but how do you resolve it and and i think you know earlier on in our discussion we we'll talked about that you know building the relationship building the trust outside of the meeting uh active listening uh, showing respect for one another so so it is uh, when when you are able to manage the that and uh, drive a disagreement towards consensus not necessarily majority voting but drive that to a consensus agreement then yeah. then that's a successful resolution yeah. thank you thank you thanks you john well i think um it is important to first of all search ourselves you know and uh, ask yourself whether you are honestly in there for the cause that this organization represents and secondly to be very conscious of the fact that we are fallible we make mistakes and therefore must be honest transparent and humble enough where you are wrong to let the members know that you made a mistake as for their forgiveness and say i'm sorry i made a mistake here and um 
let's see how we can rectify this. And if members can see through you and know that you are honest, you have integrity, you are humble, and not only that, that you truly value them. And you truly want to find a place for them to flourish in the organization, to release their, their energies, their experience, their, their knowledge. And if this comes across from you, I think you would build a very good organization. So always remember business coupled with relationship. That's important. Don't put business all the way up front without thinking about relationship. But of course, we are here for business to be done. We don't just have a club, you know, and a coffee club, and uh, we're happy, happy, and forget about the business. That's not the way. That should be a balance. Thanks, John. Thank you so much. I lost you a bit just now, but what you were talking about relationship is important. And uh, as a chairperson or as a leader, if you make a mistake, you need to admit it honestly. Thank you so much, John. Uh, Gopal? Yeah, uh, I think any non-profit Gopal, organization... can you hear me, Gopal? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, Eric can hear me, but you cannot hear me. Uh, I can hear you. Jeffrey, you have become static for some reasons for a little seconds. Can you hear me? Great, great, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I can in hear nonprofit you. organization, we are all are driven by passion, at least the board. So a very important thing is, uh, some many of you have spoken is about good communication skills, having good emo emotional intelligence, you know, understanding the people and empathy and so, and the kind of impartiality that many of you have mentioned about it, at the same time, having good negotiation skill when there is a conflict that seems to be coming up. So this a little pointers, I just want to ensure that this will actually help the nonprofit organization. Good communication, uh, I think understanding the emotional aspects of it, so the human, human aspects, then the empathy, the impartiality and how to go about a negotiating in the event there is some conflicts that are bound to happen. And the leaders, leadership by example is very, very important for to run a nonprofit organization. Thank you very much. So the impartiality is also important, right? Yes. Last but not yes. least, Eric. <laughs> Yeah also, we must recognize Eric, ahead, Eric. yeah, also we must recognize the fact that change eh, is the norm. So whatever we discuss today, tomorrow may be different. So we have that, that must have that flexibility, be it the hardware or software of the whole structure of mediation to be able to make changes. What works today may not work tomorrow. So I have always got, always got this um, uh, thinking with me to be able to do things others cannot so there's a Chinese uh, wording for it. Uh, so it sounds all the neng, but it means differently. Simply means that you must be able to do things that others cannot. So in English is very clear. So on this note, I think um, we must uh, embrace meditation uh, with the multi-racial, multi-religious background of the Singapore society. Uh, we'll be seeing a lot, a lot of um, so-called um, uh, issues that can raise some um, serious um, um, implications on the development of our nation. And the lucky thing is that Singapore has been doing it, the so-called harmony uh, thing for many years. It actually is for more than 40 years since we begin, you know, that we put in a lot of effort in the, the religious harmony uh, we got to continue you know, to put that pressure on it so that our future generations will know the efforts and all that we have put in and continue to put work. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I think it has been very interactive. 
Thank you so much for a very honest and frank discussions. We do appreciate it. Can you, maybe you guys uh, join me and put the, you know, whatever the emo, right? Uh, give them a round of applause. A good job. Thank you so much for sharing it. I think uh, there's some more questions. I think you will need it. I don't know whether time Yeah, but I think because we have, don't have time, uh, sorry for that. I apologize because we have too many questions. Uh, we will look into that. But again, thank you so much uh, for being with us in, uh, in these discussions, in this webinar. Uh, I think like Prof mentions, IAM is organizing the five days, uh, you know, certified course for a mediation, which is 8, 9, 15, 16, and 22nd May. Uh, so we really hope that you can go to the info, uh, info at imm.sg, uh, so to, if you want to enroll further. Thank you so much, one again, uh, uh, Mr. John, Huihun, Eric, and Gopal, and all of you. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, and I hope you have benefited this. And I would like to pass this to Kitson. Uh, Kitson, over to you, Kitson. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. And uh, once again, um, a very big thank you to all our um, panelists for sharing with us your experiences and insights. So we all know that board conflicts, if not managed well, can actually be detrimental uh, to the growth of our charities. And knowing how to manage them will actually help us to strengthen relationships. And thank you so much once again to all the panelists uh, for sharing with us, uh, you know, this insights, your tips on how to manage uh, with the main purpose of the ability to understand each other, build trust, and ultimately uh, is to drive good, good governance. So before CNPL closes off, uh, we'd like to invite all charities to approach CNPL as always. Uh, for all your board advisory matters um, as we continue to support you in your journey towards more effective boards. So at the same time, CNPL is also a shared services partner of the charities unit. And as such, we are committed to journey with you towards better boards, um, better governance. So we will actually be bringing you more forums as part of our Board Connect series. We used to call them Leaders Lab or Leadership on Track, if you remember. All right, we have sort of renamed them all into Bob Connect series because we want to connect with you. So please sign up with, uh, you know, so please sign up for them. And uh, one good news as well, we always have to end up with good news. Uh, there's actually one session that is coming up on the 18th of May, which is the Bot Chair Virtual Forum. And this talks about technology. So watch out for EDM. We'll be reaching out to you very, very soon. And at the same time, with our government's measures of, of easing these restrictions to allow more people to return back to office, we hope to reconnect with you once again in our MPH in MVPC so that we can see you face to face. And uh, of course, with all the safe management measures in place. So once again, uh, I stand between you and your dinner. So I wish you all the best. Please continue to stay in touch, stay well and stay safe. Thank you so much for the team at CMPL. Have a great evening.